Hi everyone, it is the beginning of August and that means that it is Women in Translation Month. I made a video last month talking you through all of the potential books that I could pick from my TBR to read in August. I'm definitely not going to get through all of them. I think I spoke about 45 different books in that video. But I thought for the first week of Women in Translation Month, I would do a themed reading vlog and I am going to try and read one book a day all of this week. So I've picked seven books off my shelf that are all by women in translation and each of them is a different language in translation as well. Um, some of them are really short. They're, I've got a hair in my, excuse me, hair in my mouth. There we go, it's gone now. Some of these are really short. Strangers Press is an amazing independent publisher based in Norwich and they have three pamphlet series publishing work by Japanese, Korean and Dutch writers and those are obviously quite short. So I have picked one from each of those pamphlet series plus four books that are on, on the shorter side from my shelves. I just think it's lovely to have a themed reading month because it's a long period of time but at the beginning of that particular month if you can kickstart your reading it's what I fancy doing and get through some short ones it makes you feel like you've made a bit of a head start so that's what we're going to be doing I will quickly show you the books that I have pulled off my shelves I'm not going to talk to you about the blurbs because obviously I'm going to read them all or at least I hope to read all of them in this video that you're watching and we don't need to repeat ourselves. So I will just show you what I've picked. The first one is translated from Russian. It's by Ludmila Petruskevsia and it's translated by Anna Summers. It's called There Once Lived a Mother Who Loved Her Children Until They Moved Back In. This is three novellas. Next one is translated from Norwegian. It's by Kirsty A. Skonsvold and it's called The Child. Translated from Norwegian by Martin Aitken. Then we have an old translated from French. This is The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Mass and it is translated from French by Frank Wynne. I've chosen a poetry collection that has been translated from Spanish. This is by Lania Rodriguez Iglesias and it's called A Little Body Are Many Parts. And this has two translators. This is by Serafina Vick and Abigail Parry. Then these are the three pamphlets I've picked published by Strangers Press. So the Dutch one is by Marge Wartel and it's called Something Has to Happen and it is translated from the Dutch by Joseph van der Voort. Uh, Bowser's Millennia Millennia Static translated by Deborah Smith from Korean and then also a Japanese one called Friendship for grown-ups. I love this cover which is by Naokola Yamazaki and it's translated from the Japanese by Polly Barton. Can't get enough of this cover. So these are the seven books that I plan to read over the next seven days. I think it's doable even though work is quite busy at the moment but some of these are very short. I think it's doable. I'm going to check in with you as I'm reading each one tell you my thoughts and all of that stuff and I'll throw some some walks and some some cooking footage in as well because that's what I like to do in reading vlogs so please do join me. I think this might be the weirdest lunch that I've ever concocted like none of these things go with each other <laughs> so I had some cucumber that I needed to use so I've made these maki rolls and then we have some leftover tortilla, which I, I didn't make. This is this is just from a packet, so I'm going to eat that. And then we had some fruit, so I decided I would make us some mini pavlovas, which actually have not turned out to be that mini, but I'm not going to argue with that. But, um, yeah, Japanese, Spanish, New Zealand lunch platter today. Cool. Good morning. We are not getting off to a good start with this reading vlog because the first one is a DNF and I don't know, maybe I need to pick up an eighth book because I didn't finish this one. I'm not sure. We'll see how the rest of the reading vlog goes and if I've got time, maybe I'll pick up an eighth book. But this was the first one I decided to go for and this is The Mad Woman's Ball by Victoria Mass. This is a historical fiction novel set in 1885 yep, in Paris and it is about... An asylum where a doctor has locked up women that he deems hysterical, he's given them water treatment, and every year there is a ball where people can come and essentially gawp at these women, and, and some of this is based on real life events and, and real people. And I had hoped that I was gonna really love this book, but I didn't. I read about 100 pages and just thought, 
this is just not for me. It was giving me the same feeling that I got when I read Mexican Gothic earlier this year, which I know is a book that so many people love. And I think that so many people would, would love this one too. With both books, I had similar issues in that I feel as though women's mental health is talked about in almost this ethereal kind of way, which I find slightly odd given that that's exactly what it is critiquing. Um, and also that the both worlds to me didn't feel fully formed or at least fully formed before I got there. Do you ever have that feeling when you're reading a book and you can almost see the world being crafted around you instead of it just being fully realized by the time you got there? That's how I felt about this book. And with the writing style, it did feel a little bit stilted and I couldn't work out if that was obviously the text itself, the original text or the translation of that text. That's something I will never know. But this just wasn't to my taste, but I think that lots of people would really like this. Um, so if the premise intrigues you, maybe try and read a sample page or two and see if it is your kind of thing. So I'm gonna put this one to one side, give it to somebody else who I think will enjoy it more than me. And let us move on to the next one. I'm not sure what the next book will be, but when I pick it up and I read it, I will tell you about it because that's what this video is for. <laughs> permed wig and I kind of love it. I feel like I should be in Dirty Dancing or Grease or starting a band. I don't know if I will ever have the guts to wear this out of the house, but for inside, this is fun. I enjoy. Okay, we're having a much better time now. I have read The Child by Kirsty A. Skomsvold and this is translated from Norwegian by Martin Aiken. I think that's right. Did I just make that up? No, that is correct. That is correct. Um, so this is a a memoir about how she feels after giving birth to her second child and this is written to her second child when she's mainly talking about the first child so the child in question is the first child that she has had she's talking about um postpartum depression she's talking about how she feels trying to get back into writing and work as a mother and her worries from her first pregnancy and birth. And I think I'm lacking some context for this for having not read her previous book, which was called Monster Human, which was about the first pregnancy. But I don't think that matters at all. And in a way, I'm kind of glad to have read this first. I feel like I've got an overview of context and what to expect from that novel, which I think is nearly 500 pages long. So this is much shorter. This book is blurbed by Sarah Moss and Liz Berry two writers who I love but also write about motherhood so exquisitely. If you haven't read Night Waking by Sarah Moss, highly recommend as well as all of her books. And if you haven't read Liz Berry's The Republic of Motherhood, then do. I actually made a whole video talking about the title poem in the chat book, The Republic of Motherhood, which I'll link in the description box down below because it is one of my favorite poems of all time. I love how she talks about her relationship with her partner, Bo, and how when they were trying to conceive, they traveled to lots of places as if almost they were trying to find the child in those places. It says, we traveled such a lot that spring. It was if there were all sorts of places we had to visit so we could make a child. As if we had to try out different cities to see where we could make the child we wanted, or else we were looking for the seed of our child outside ourselves. As if the child was something we could find, if only we went to the right place. And so we went to New York. There's lots of beautiful discussion of autumn in here, and we know that I love all things autumnal. There are sentences like, sometimes I thought I heard a child's laughter, but when I turned to look, it was only the wind. She talks about how 
life is almost a series of ghostings and I don't mean that in, in, in ghosting of people but I mean in, in how people appear to us as ghosts like the more distance that we have from them life becomes transparent it's a constant losing of people as well as a gaining of people when we when we make new friends or in this case when we bring a child into the world but also how absolutely terrifying that is and how sometimes that living and ghost-like existence can come together in in ways that we really don't expect and can be absolutely horrifying uh, as new mothers you know hoping that you're going to keep this child alive that the world has somehow allowed you to take home from the hospital and you're, you're just floundering and trying to do your best so uh successful second read for this week um and i'm gonna move on to the next book and i'll see you in a bit Another successful read. I have finished reading Lania Rodriguez Iglesias' poetry collection. This is A Little Body Are Many Parts. This is translated from the Spanish by Abigail Parry and Serafina Vick, and she is a Cuban poet. And I really enjoyed reading the introduction where Serafina Vick was talking about the translation process and how her and Abigail work together. So essentially, Abigail would translate the poems from Spanish into English, but Abigail would help with context for the poems that were specifically Cuban and perhaps political aspects or play on words that Abigail may have missed. And then Abigail would then rewrite the translated poems into things that would more accurately reflect the original and the intent of the author whilst also making it poetic in English as well. There are samples of poems from eight different collections within this book and I enjoyed many of them. I think the one that I enjoyed the most was from her book, The Perfect Moment, which has a series of poems about different coloured rooms and those I think are the most surreal and I had bought this book because I read a newly translated poem of hers in Poetry London and that one was particularly surreal so I think that's the kind of work by her that I'm drawn to the most and I have a weird fascination with this idea of compartmentalising rooms and turning them into colours or, or having rooms represent certain things I feel like several of my favourite books have those elements, which feels like a very specific thing to like. But this is the beginning of a poem called Orange Room. Before I danced with my dance partner in a cellar filled with candles and luminous pumpkins. Before was before, I fed myself mostly on fruit. I mostly hid under the bed and the bed springs made my skull bleed and some birds came and drank the liquid. My dance partner doesn't exist, but the luminous pumpkins do. I just think that it's really delightful. I really, really love that. And there are several poems in here about houses and bodies, some really great queer poetry in here. I enjoyed this one and I would, would recommend. I think I mentioned at the beginning of this vlog that I was going to include some cooking footage, which I know I have done, and that I would include some walking footage as well. But I don't think I am going to be going on a walk, but I do have some or a walk worth you know vlogging that isn't just walking around um the streets right next to our flat um i will insert some footage here of a walk that i did on hampstead heath last year like last winter early last winter i went to hampstead heath and the light was really beautiful and i went for a walk with sana um so i will insert some of that that footage here um, I was planning to go for a walk later, but my arthritis is quite bad today, so I don't think I'm going to go. Feeling quite grumpy about about that. I'll go for a walk uh, later, but my joints are just very swollen and uh, and painful, as you can uh, see, illustrated by my my wrist here, which is uh, the size of about four different wrists. So um, I am gonna uh, rest, keep reading, and I will insert some footage of that walk from nearly a year ago. How was that nearly a year ago? There was a meme I saw the other day, which was um, Sam from Avengers running with the subtitle, um, not subtitle, with the uh, cat 
caption. That's it with the caption. Sam being uh, me still processing 2020 and then Steve running up behind him with the uh, subheading 2022 in four months. And I thought, oh my God, yes, it is 2022 in four months. Wow. Anyway, uh, I will continue reading. I'll be back soon. Enjoy this footage from, from, from last year and we can dream of autumns to come. Not that we're hurrying this year on any faster because it doesn't need it. It's a few days later and I've now read the three pamphlets which are published by Strangers Press. And I really, really enjoyed all of these. Let me speak to you about them in ascending order of enjoyment, though they're all quite close to each other because as I said, I really like them. So I think the one I enjoyed the least out of the three, but still really loved is this one here called Milena Milena Ecstatic by Bae Sua. And this is translated from the Korean by Deborah Smith, who translates all of Hong Kong's work and she runs Tilted Axis Press. So this is one very, very short novella, which is about a man who is writing a film script and he wants to go and record this film, film it by himself. And he's got the funding to do that. And he looks at everyone around him as if they are a film and he observes them, but he bemoans the fact that no one ever really seems to study him. And it, it's like this sense of not being observed is making him exist less and less and it has this surreal touch to it which mirrors the film that he wants to make which I found really lovely and I love the amount of detail at the beginning and all the small things he's doing in his life how he makes coffee just felt very atmospheric weirdly it felt like a really autumnal book to read I don't know if that's just because it's raining today and that's when I happen to be reading it but I just thought it was I don't know, cosy is perhaps not the right word because there is a kind of unsettling feel to this as well. But I would definitely recommend this. A one that I enjoyed a little bit more than that, I would say is this one, which is the Dutch pamphlet. This is Something Has to Happen by Marjorie Wartel and this is translated from the Dutch by Joseph van der Voort. This is a pamphlet which has three short stories in it, but they are thematically linked and you can even read it as it being the same characters in each story, even though that isn't explicitly stated. So if we read it as the same characters, it's about a husband and wife whose son has died. So the first story is from the point of view of the wife who is angrily and sometimes nastily trying to get the attention of her husband because her grief is taking over her and she feels like she can't connect with him at all. The 
middle story is about a woman who is grieving, who has gone to lots of different kinds of therapy and then goes to a lumberjack camp, which only has men in it. And she is there to scream at trees in the hope of getting all of her grief out. And then the final story goes back to the, the father, the husband, who is dealing with his grief at losing his son in a very different way. And all of these three feel very poignant. And I think having them as different stories shows how people process emotions in different ways and how they can feel extremely separate from each other, even if they're within, you know, in this case, the same book or in the context of a family, they're in the same family struggling to to bridge the gap between stories, between selves. I thought that worked really well. And my favorite out of the three was the Japanese translation. So this is Friendship for Grown Ups by now Kala Yamazaki. And again, this is three stories, but they are thematically linked and they have reoccurring characters. They're kind of about evolution. The first one is literally about evolution, but in a, in a surrealist kind of way, it's an origin story. If you have read my book, The Beginning of the World in the Middle of the Night, when in the title story, the characters are telling each other imagined versions of the origin of the world. That's exactly what this first one is like. It's like someone is speaking the existence of the world into the dark at night. Um, and I, I really enjoyed that one. And then the second one is about mourning the loss of a relationship that you have evolved out of. Um, and the third one is about writing the self and writing of relationships. And can you write yourself into existence? So I really liked how not only these stories explored the themes of evolution, but the theme of evolution seemed to evolve in each story too. And I thought that it was poignant and clever and I enjoyed it very, very much indeed. And I don't know if I said, but these are translated by Polly Barton. So if you haven't checked out Strangers Press before, I very much recommend doing so. I will link them in the description box down below. Um, so let me move on to the final book that I need to read now. Yes, the final one, which is the Russian book in translation. You know what's really frustrating? When you keep a book on your shelf for a while because you think it's going to be a brilliant book, a book that just ticks all of the things that you love. So it's a safe bet to pick up on a rainy day. I have a couple of books like that and maybe the longer they stay on the shelf indicates there's a little bit of doubt because maybe you haven't picked it up because you're worried they're going to be a disappointment. Anyway, that happened with one of the books on my TBR this week. Um, I have a couple of Ludmilla's books on my shelf and I thought I would love them because she writes novellas inspired by fairy tale and they're gruesome and, and dark. But I read this book, which is There Once Lived a Mother Who Loved Her Children Until They Moved Back In, which is three novellas about family. Um, one of them is about someone who worries her husband is going to kill her. One of them is about a mother who does a terrible thing um, under the guise of saving her son. But I really didn't enjoy this book at all. I found the book really stilted and not enjoyable to read it didn't flow well at all especially the first one the first novella is the longest out of all of them and um, we're introduced to about i don't know 10 different characters at the beginning at this dinner party jumping from character to character in a series of things that end up being quite non-consequential and i found that a little bit odd given how long the piece was i love stuff like that in longer novels just scene setting and all of that but this just felt a little bit redundant so i didn't enjoy this book at all and i'm super sad about it and i have another one of her books on my shelf before and they've been sitting there for years because i was sure i would love them given that they are fairy tale inspired but no i was hoping for i guess angela carter type writing and that is not what this book is so i did finish it because it was three different things and i thought that maybe you know, the next one would be better, but that just didn't happen. So that's not great. Um, so I am going to pick up an eighth book, given that um, I DNF'd one at the very beginning of this vlog. So I'm going to pick maybe a short story collection, and I'm going to start reading that now. And I will talk to you about the story or stories that I end up reading, and then I'll continue reading it throughout the rest of the month, as well as hopefully some other books for Women in Translation Month too. So I'll check in with you in a little bit. I'm so glad that I decided to pick up an eighth book because this means we get to end on a high note, which is obviously a really nice thing to do. I decided to pick up Flowers of Mold by Ha Song Nan. This is translated from the Korean by Janet Hong. I actually read the first story in this collection in my Halloween reading vlog last year, which I'll link in the description box. And now I've read the second story and I'll continue to read the rest of the stories 
throughout Women in Translation Month and I'll speak about it more in my wrap up. But I am in really enjoying the extended metaphors and linking imagery in each story. It makes everything feel very vivid and just very pleasing to read. Like it's all tied together, very deliberate, very precise. Um, content warning for sexual assault in this book. In the second story, Nightmare, it's about a teenager teenage girl who lives on a pear orchard with her parents and she's sexually assaulted and then she seeks revenge for that and there's a lot of imagery to do with fruit and rotten fruit she compares all of the men that she meets to the wind and how they're like a howling noise that are going past her through her that she can't quite grasp and they're weathering her body the writing is really fantastic i will read you the first couple of sentences from this it says the alarm didn't go off this morning she lay curled up like a millipede and heard the old grandfather clock strike six times in the downstairs living room it was always five minutes slow she woke from habit and the early light not the few digital tones of animal farm that her alarm clock normally played on loop until she turned it off her fingers crept to the bedside table but she couldn't find the metal chill of the clock and again we've got imagery linking there to animal farm and dystopian um, themes which is very in keeping with the rest of the story as well I enjoyed this one thoroughly and I also have bought another short story collection by Ha Song Nan and I don't think I'll get to that this month but I can add it to the shelf this one is called Bluebeard's First Wife the blurb of this one also sounds brilliant it says it's about disasters accidents and deaths abound and um, there are about arguments in apartment blocks one of them is about a terrible secret that has kept two people bound together since high school and one of the stories is about a family who is devastated because their dog has gone missing but the parents spend so much time trying to find this dog that they then neglect their child. I would say with both of these books, well with the stories that I've read so far and from the blurbs, really use folklore elements within their work in a way that I really love. So if you like the kind of books that I enjoy reading, I don't know why I'm like dancing these around in the air, then I think you would really love her work too. So this reading vlog has been a success in the sense that I read all of the books I said I was going to read. I didn't love all of them but I did have a very good success rate and obviously you can't love every single book you read and that's okay. I would love to know if you have read any of these books or if you would like to now that I've spoken about them. I will list them in the description box down below. I will also link my Women in Translation Month TBR video where I talked about I think about 45 different books if you would like to go see more books in translation. I would love to know which books you have read this month if you're reading any for Women in Translation Month or if not in general what your favourite books by Women in Translation are. If you're new to this channel it would be lovely if you would like to subscribe and stick around. I make videos about books every week. <laughs> I'm always here. Uh, you can find me like clockwork. I hope that you're all having a good start to the week and I will speak to you very soon. Sending lots of love. Bye.